Okay, thanks everybody for coming. I'm speaking English because I don't think that David speaks much French. I'm very pleased to welcome him here at Collège de France. Uh, there is a connection between you and Collège de France which I've which I recently discovered that your supervisor was Jan Hattin, and Jan Hattin was a professor at Collège de France between 2000 and 2006. So I'm very happy to introduce David um, because he's been doing very important work in many areas of philosophy, philosophy of science, in metaphysics, in epistemology, also philosophy of sport, and of course, above all, the philosophy of mind. Uh, he's well known for his work on consciousness in particular, so people are working on in this area and interested in, in his work, but he's a, a pioneer in the several areas of uh, like teleosemantics and, and the theory of mental files, which is of special interest to me because we've just started a new ERC project on this topic and he's going to talk about this in his lectures. Now, those lectures are part of a series, the context and content lectures that started a long time ago. I'm not going to say much about that because I don't want to take too much time given that we only have one hour for his talk and I know that he has for this first lecture quite a lot of material. So uh, I will give him the floor, but before doing so, I want to award him the the Medal of the Collège de France. Um, <laughs> so, I didn't tell you about this, but... No, you didn't. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That's very good. Thank you. Yeah, it's very, very fine. Thank you very much, Francois. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me here. And uh, you're right, my, my supervisor, Ian Hacking, was uh, not sure one of the first foreigners to be made a professor here, but he was very proud of it. And so I'm glad to be talking today. So uh, I can't resist showing this fine picture. My, my daughter, who's a painter, that was used to illustrate the poster for this, this uh, series of lectures. And here's the plan of the lectures. If you, if you saw the poster, you'll see that there's four lectures under those, under those headings. And today I'll talk mostly about concepts. I'll look at some ideas by uh, Mark Sainsbury, uh, Michael Tai, by Francois himself. Uh, and uh, I won't go through all that. Uh, I will see if I have too much material or too little. Uh, I do hope to stop uh, 15 minutes from the end so we can have some, some discussion. So let's see how far we get. Let me just start with a couple of general methodological points before I get into to argument. Uh, my subject uh, for these four lectures will be the structure of cognition. And the central theme will be need, the need to think of cognition in relation to the external world as well as the way it works internally to the mind. In a way, I just think of this as a matter of taking mental representation seriously. There's, there's a, a strain in cognitive science, perhaps the dominant strain, that thinks of mental representations as internal items that contribute to the machinery of, of cognition. Well, they are that, but if mental representation means anything, it's a matter of relations between, between thoughts, items inside the head, and, and the world beyond. And one theme I want to develop is that we won't be able to understand the internal workings properly unless we think of them in relation to the world that they represent. Second little point, my framework is, is naturalistic. I'll be drawing on various aspects of biology, cognitive science, other empirical 
disciplines in developing my ideas. But I'm not going to work in a framework that's completely divorced from everyday thinking about the mind, common sense thinking about the mind. I think of the, the way to proceed in these matters is to start with thoughts that come naturally to us and, and improve them by the findings of cognitive science. We can't start in the vacuum. So I'm going to start with the idea that thoughts are primarily beliefs, but also non-committal thoughts like suppositions, hopes, etc., are, are complex entities who are, whose components are concepts. You might think of it on the model of a sentences whose components are, components are, are words. So thoughts are, are, are complex complex representations built up from concepts. And what are concepts? Well, I'm going to start with what I want to call philosophical common sense. Uh, I don't know how widespread this kind of common sense is, but here's how I was brought up as a philosopher. Here's how you are to think about concepts. Here's a, a few features of concepts. Concepts are things that, as I've just said, compose thoughts. Think on the model of uh, words fitting together in a sentence, concepts fitting together in a thought. Secondly, concepts cut finer than reference. You can have two distinct concepts that refer to the same item. And this is standardly taken to happen when we have uh, cases where somebody thinks of a certain object, both F and not if. Somebody thinks Hesperus is visible and phosphorus is not visible. And Frege's criterion of cognitive significance says that in such a case we have to suppose that there's two concepts in play. Uh, in the first case the thinker is thinking of Venus, that it's visible using the concept <coughs> expressed by the word Hesperus. In the second case uh, is thinking uh, 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 a thought with the same referential concept. Venus is, uh, well, about the same thing, is not visible using a different, a different concept. You might think of th this multiplication of concepts, two different concepts with the same reference, as a way of preserving the thinker's rationality. The thinker is thinking inconsistent thoughts, they can't both be true, but uh, at the level of concepts, the two thoughts do not contradict each other. In effect, the thinking is, thinker is thinking of A, that it's F, and of B, now it's thinking of the same object in a different way, that it's not F. Something else that uh, our philosophical tradition takes widely as given is that concepts are public entities. Uh, two people can have the same concept. They can, they can share, share concepts. Uh, we both have a concept of an electron, say, or of general relativity, or of uh, uh, Kirstarmer. Uh, different people can share, can share concepts. Different people can grasp the same concept. What kinds of things, natural way to think about concepts is they're constituted by informational content. That, that a concept uh, contains a number of items of information, descriptions of the thing it's about, and that's what makes up the concept. Uh, uh, you might think of concepts as, as senses, as a way of thinking about the object. And finally, it's widely supposed that uh, concepts pick out the thing they refer to as that thing that satisfies the information uh, built into the concept. I might I might have a concept of Keir Starmer as a person who looks a certain way, is the Prime Minister of Britain, and then uh, my concept will refer to Keir Starmer in virtue of the fact that that, that person, that man, uh, is the person, the unique person who looks that way, and is the Prime Minister of Britain. Okay, I am going to discard most of these ideas. I'm going to preserve only the idea that concepts composed thoughts, and a version of the second criterion that says when people have contradictory thoughts, they must have two 
about some objects, they must have two concepts. But I'm going to drop the idea that they're public entities, that they're constituted by informational content, and that their reference is determined as the thing that satisfies their informational content. You might wonder, given I'm giving up all that, should we still speak of concepts? And some philosophers, uh, Ruth Millikan, who incidentally is going to be... Uh, uh, her thoughts are behind a lot of the things I'm going to be saying in these lectures. She thinks we should drop talk of concepts. Her most recent book is called Beyond Concepts. She coins a new term, unicepts, for the kind of items that I will call concepts. But I don't see any reason to be so, so terminologically revisionary. Uh, uh, I'm going to stick with the term concept, and just remember, I don't mean by concept what uh, most philosophers uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so have meant. Let me start arguments by noting that two and three are in great tension. It's very difficult to have a view that uh, applies Frege's criterion for counting concepts and allows concepts to be public entities that can be shared by different thinkers. And here's a uh, uh, perhaps not so well-known now, but 20, 30 years ago, very well-known argument stemming from Brian Law originally in the mid-80s that shows that two subjects can't share a concept if they disagree in any of their beliefs evolving the concept. So as soon as you have a Keir Starmer thought that's different from my Keir Starmer thought, or as soon as you have an elephant thought that's different from my elephant thoughts, uh, we can't have the same concept. Here's the argument. Uh, Imagine some, some woman, Jane, she has normal beliefs about tigers, uh, including that they can interbreed with lions. Uh, here's another person, John, all the same beliefs, except he thinks that uh, tigers can't interbreed with lions. No reason to suppose it looks like it that, that they have different concepts of a tiger. Uh, they think of tigers in almost identical ways, apart from those little any difference of opinion. But now consider a third person who has all Jane's beliefs about animals that he calls tigers and all John's beliefs about animals he calls panthera tigris. <coughs> and he doesn't realise that uh, tigers and panthera tigris are in fact uh, co-referring terms. And he thinks that tigers can interbreed with lions and Panthera tigris can't. And so even though the two terms refer to the same species, we have to suppose that he's got two different concepts. Uh, 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 concept he expresses by tiger, concept he expresses by Panther tigris. That's why, uh, it, uh, despite his rationality, uh, I mean, sorry, given his rationality, he's not contradicting himself when he thinks tigers can interbreed with lions and Panthera tigris cannot. Okay, so he's got two different concepts, but his tiger concept is as close to Jane's as can be. He shares all Jane's tiger thoughts. And his other concept is as close to John's. So Jane and John must have different concepts uh, that they express by the word tiger. And that's a rather unhappy conclusion because they were almost identical in their thinking. And... People who like public concepts and the Fregean criterion of cognitive difference can try and wriggle here, but it's very hard to wriggle out of this argument because, note, it didn't, didn't assume anything much about how concepts are constituted. It didn't assume that they're meaning, con the concept constituting beliefs. It just took, uh, uh, just took Simon and uh, applied the Fregean, Fregean criterion and then exported the difference that we have within Simon to two different people. So Simon's got two concepts, but this concept is the same as that, this concept is the same as that, they've got different concepts. And we end up with the idea that no two people can have the same concept unless they share all their beliefs. And a happy conclusion. We do want to uh, allow, and I'm going to come back to this, that people can share, share concepts. 
one way of dealing with this kind of argument is to drop uh, two and stick with the idea that concepts are publicly shared entities, uh, avoid Law's argument by denying that you can apply the Fregean criterion of cognitive difference in all cases. And that's what Mark Sainsby and Michael Tai do in their book about 10 years ago, Seven Puzzles of Thought. They have an, an, an originalist theory of concepts. They think concepts are constituted by where they originated. Uh, their paradigm of a concept is you've got a public word, tiger say, and uh, spreads around, people uh, uh, use the word, and they all have the, the concept, the same concept, tiger, because their concept is descended from the same origin. Doesn't work very well. Here's the, the hard case for them. Uh, Paderewski. Paderewski, the, the Polish statesman, uh, fine pianist, uh, uh, standard philosophical example, somebody sees the pianist, uh, hears about the statesman, uh, doesn't realize that they're two people, the two people called Paderewski are the same person. And uh, they might end up, Peter, thinking that, that Paderewski is a fine pianist and simultaneously thinking Paderewski is not a fine pan. It's because they think there's two, two different, different people. And the natural thought, the thought that I'm going to defend, is look, uh, 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 this person's got two concepts. Two concepts, uh, 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 both expressed by the uh, name Paderewski, but this person uh, uh, has uh, two, different, two different concepts. And uh, that's why they're not contradicting themselves. Sainsbury and Ty can't say this natural thing. They want to say this person just has one concept. They're contradicting themselves. It's like somebody who thinks that uh, uh, Lucy lives at a house numbered 197, and Lucy lives at a house that isn't a prime number, and uh, not realize they're contradicting themselves because they haven't thought it through. But it doesn't look like this Peter case is somebody who hasn't thought it through. It's just they've got two different, two different concepts. So it's been have trouble in the other direction. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, are forced to say that when somebody knows that a certain thing has uh, different names in the public language, that person has to have a bunch of different concepts for the thing. That's ugly. That's ugly too. So I think the move we should make in response to Sainsbury and Ty's difficulties is to give up, give up three instead. Give up the idea that concepts are public entities that can be shared by different people. I think we want to switch to a rather different way of thinking about what's going on. A more naturalist way, a, 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 a way that... that is, is uh, fairly obviously suggested by the thought that the mind is just the brain, a neural structure uh, inside the head. Let's think of concepts as private items inside the heads of particular subjects. They're particular persisting objects to which items of information can get attached. So, so think about words in the language of thought. Okay, these, these are metaphors, which I'm going to come back to later, but, but think that inside the head there are structures that are sentence-like and they're composed of words. Uh, that's what I'm going to think of concepts as. Persisting particular objects in the heads of people. Uh, mental files. So later on I'll be talking about Francois's book, Mental Files. This adopts the same view of what concepts are. They're items inside the head, they stay inside your head, and as you learn more and more about what they refer to, you attach more and more information to them. And now the thing about Peter, who's confused about Paderewski, is simple enough. He, he has two concepts, uh, both acquired from the same source, but uh, uh, he somehow uh, opened two mental files, created two mental words, 
and start attaching different information to the two of them. Seems a perfectly natural, straightforward thing to say. Note now, there's no question of two subjects, two different subjects, sharing one and the same, numerically the same concept. The, 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 the persisting object in my head cannot be the same object as the persisting object in your head. Any more that you can have the same nose as me. All right? I've got my nose, you can't have... Well, we could do not, but anyway. Uh, 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 the idea of two people having the same concept makes no more sense than two people having the same, same nose. Okay, so now concepts are particulars inside people's heads. This doesn't rule out our typing concepts as qualitatively, if not quantitatively, the same. Uh, you might want to ask, is your concept of the same type as my concept? Do you have the same type of concept as me? And we want some notion of two people having concepts of the same type if we're going to make any sense of the idea, as we do want to make sense of, that two people can share a thought, that they can communicate a thought, they can both learn the same thing. We want to be able to talk about two people having the same thought, not now that it's made of the same particular objects, that makes no sense, but that it's the same type of object. And the most obvious way in which you might want to uh, say two concepts are of the same type is if they have the same reference. Uh, so I have a Keir Starmer concept, and you have a Keir Starmer concept, and uh, these two concepts are the same in respect of the fact that they both refer to the same person. Okay, in this lecture I'm going to assume that it makes perfectly good sense to say that two concepts have the same reference. Uh, as in, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that as indeed it does make sense. I haven't told you, though, anything about what makes it the case that some concept has the reference it does. Earlier, talking about the standard philosophical idea of a concept, we had the idea that a concept refers to what it does because the information in the concept, the information that constitutes the concept, picks out that object as the referent. But we can't give this answer any longer because we're not thinking of concepts as constituted by information. I have a different story about what makes it the case that concepts refer to what they do, and I'll come back to that later. But let's just take it as given for the moment that concepts do have reference and that we can type, type uh, concepts uh, as the same type of concept, thereby constituting the same thought, uh, by appealing to the idea that two concepts can have the same reference. Now, I'm going to be arguing, and this will be a main theme throughout these lectures, that we don't need to type concepts any more finely than reference. The, the, uh, the idea that uh, we need to think of concepts as involving some more fine grain kind of constitution is unnecessary. We can do all the work we want to do in the philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, by thinking of concepts as just having a reference. No other kind of typing is needed. I'm going to be arguing that, but it doesn't follow from what I've said so far. I've said we want to type concepts as of the same type. Here's one way of typing them. They have the same reference. But we might have more fine-grained ways of typing them. And in fact, the standard idea is, well, I think of an object one way. Uh, I think of an object as uh, uh, the morning star. You think of the object as the evening star. Uh, uh, we might say that these are two different concepts because they're presenting their referent in different ways. I haven't ruled out uh, the possibility of such fine-grained modes of presentation. It's just that I don't, I'm going to be arguing that we don't really need them. The argument's to come. So I'm, I'm leaving it open that we might want to type concepts by the mode in which they present their object. But watch out, we don't want to type too finely. We don't want to, to let 
any difference in beliefs attached to two concepts within a subject show that the concepts are of different types. Otherwise, we'll be back in Law's argument and uh, uh, we'll be multiplying types uh, uh, unnecessarily and unhelpfully. So it follows from what I've said so far that we're going to have to allow that sometimes an individual can have two distinct concepts of just the same type. <coughs> so suppose Peter thinks Paderewski is Polish. He thinks it twice, right? I want to say it's just the same thought he's having twice. Think of Simon earlier with his two tiger concepts, and he thinks uh, tigers are felines. He thinks it twice. I want to say we want to allow that these are two different thoughts of just the same type. To make sense, of, think, think of, uh, uh, I've got two cars that are the same car. I've got two Vauxhall Sephiras. Uh, perfectly natural to say you can have two numerically distinct individuals that are the same type. So Peter has two numerically distinct thoughts that are the same, the same thought. Uh, this is going to become important in my last lecture when I talk about consciousness and various arguments involving uh, the identity of mind and brain. As I said, nothing in the argument so far rule out the idea that uh, we can type finer than reference. So, in Francois's book, Mental Files, 2012, he has a picture very much one, like the one I've developed so far, but he thinks we should type mental files, that's his term for words in the language of thought, by epistemically rewarding relations. That's a, a technical term. We should type them by the way the subject is related to the reference. So you have one concept, one mental file, when you, when you are in perceptual contact with the reference. You have a different concept, a different mental file, when you, when you remember the reference. Uh, you have a yet further concept mental file when having originally met some reference, some person, you meet them again and you recognize them. Uh, so, uh, three different concepts, three different mental files. I meet somebody, I perceiving them, I start acquiring information, I put it into uh, the perceptual file. When, when, I, when I leave them, when I lose perceptual contact with them, that file ceases to exist. But I can have a memory of that person, and then there's a memory concept of that person, a memory file. Uh, or later on, I might, I might uh, re-encounter the person, uh, uh, recognize them, and now I'll activate a recognitional file. Now, you might worry, look, hang on, we've got these different, different files in this case. Uh, surely when I remember somebody, I think about them when they're not there, uh, later that evening I think about the person I met during the day, surely I'll have available the information that I acquired when I met them, what they look like, how big they are. Uh, 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 maybe I'll, I'll do some reasoning while I remember them and figure out that they must know so-and-so and, -so and uh, I get some further information. And then you might think, well, when I recognize them, uh, 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 surely that information will be available to me again. But there's nothing in the story I've told so far that guarantees that the information that goes into the perceptual file will be in the memory file and in the recognitional file. Now, in, in, in response to that worry, Francois says, oh, well, we, tr we transfer the information. Uh, 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 we have the information we first got on for the perceptual encounter, uh, uh, but that file ceases to exist when you're not in contact with the person anymore. But then when you remember them, you transfer all the information from the perceptual file into the memory file. 
and so again into the recognitional file when you re-encounter them. Okay, I wrote a paper uh, a couple of years after in, in a symposium on Francois's book where I said, that just seems much too complicated. Why are we making things so complicated? Here's a much simpler story. When I meet somebody for the first time, I open a file and I now start putting all the information I acquire about them into that file. At first I get information by looking at them and seeing what they look like and how big they are and so on. And then I keep that file. And then later on, when I remember them, I might uh, do some reasoning and augment the information in that file. And then later on, uh, uh, I re-encounter them, I've still got the file, and now I get some more information I put into the file. Well, what was the point of having all these different files when we could just open one name-like file when we meet somebody or encounter any, any object or are told about some object or uh, get any kind of relationship to the object? We open a file and we start putting all the information we get about that object into the file. What's the, what's the point of the multiplication of files. Now, in fact, Francois, in more uh, recent writings, has come, to, has come to agree. He says, no, no, let, let's not think of files as these uh, 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 relation-constituted entities. Let's agree that there's just one pile of information that you have about a putative referent, which you uh, 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 augment and increase as time goes, and uh, uh, think about the mental file just as that accumulating pile of information. Just like you get a name for somebody and you attach lots of information to that name. And in general, when we have a concept of some object, we can think about it on this name-like name-like model. So Reconati has now come to the view that we don't need to multiply all these different uh, epistemically rewarding relation files. We'll just have one name-like file whenever we start thinking about an object. But his more recent writing does retain something of the old view. He still thinks about modes of presentation being involved when you exercise a file, you form a thought about some object, there'll be some particular way in which you're in contact with the object at that time, you're perceiving it, you're remembering it, you're, uh, you're recognizing it, and he still wants to type thoughts uh, by the way in which you are related to the object. I'm going to say, as I said, that I don't think we need this more fine-grained typing. But let me pause at this point and ask, why is it better to think? I mean, Francois agrees about this, and I think maybe everybody will agree, maybe, I don't know, that if we're going to have these mental files, these words in the language of thought, uh, it's better to have uh, uh, one big name-like file than lots of transhistory uh, uh, files constituted by your relation, your current relation to the object. But let me pause and ask, why is it better to think in this way? Or rather, just to focus the issue, it's not why is it better for us to think of subjects as having name-like files, but let's just get down to the first order issue. Why is it better for subjects to have name-like files rather than multiplying files depending on how they're acquainted currently acquainted with the object of thought. And you might think it's not obvious that it's a good thing for subjects to just lump all the information about objects they meet into one big file. Because there's a danger here. There's a danger of forming what Millikan calls confused ideas. I, I meet somebody, I, I uh, perceive them, I start accumulating some information about them, and later on I meet somebody else and I take them to be the same person, 
But in fact, they aren't. I mean, I didn't really. I mean, when my, I'm, my face recognition is not that great. Quite often, when I first meet some people, I'm not very good at telling whether it's the same person again. Uh, th there's a danger that I can merge two files when, in fact, there's two objects at issue, and I'm uh, 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 going to put information that attaches to two different people into the same file, and whichever way you take the files referring to this person or that person, I'm going to have a lot of false, false beliefs. And you might think it would be better for people to err on the side of caution, to hold, hold apart differently sourced uh, 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 bodies of information until, until they're, uh, they're certain, until they're sure that they relate to the same, same object. You can avoid this danger of erroneously confusing, confusing ideas by, by keeping the files part, apart, as, as, as Francois did in his original book. So you might think it would be more rational, more sensible, uh, more safe not to merge files when there was any scintilla of doubt around. But I think that's wrong. I think that failing to merge files when they refer to the same thing is itself a kind of irrationality. Uh, now you might think this is a bit weird. The whole point of, of uh, allowing people to have different concepts of the same object where they don't take them to be the same thing was to allow people in cases like Hesperus and Phosphorus uh, to, to uh, have what are semantically uh, uh, referentially inconsistent thoughts without committing them without accusing them of irrationality you allow them to ma maintain their consistency despite the fact their thoughts are consistent by having them multiply multiply concepts and it's true that keeping the concepts apart not merging them into one big file will minimize the chance of Cartesian irrationality. It will minimize the chance of Cartesian error. But that's not the only kind of rationality that we want to think about in the cognitive context. There's also what, following Peter Godfrey Smith, I'm going to call uh, Jamesian irrationality. Uh, succumbing to the failing of ignorance. There's the danger that you will not acquire enough beliefs. Uh, it's very easy to avoid error. It's to minimize the number of beliefs you form. The fewer beliefs, the fewer ch less chance there is of error. But of course, a healthy uh, 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 cognitive system will uh, not only avoid error, but want to avoid ignorance. I mean, in truth, the two desiderata tend to pull uh, against each other. But uh, we want to respect both of them. And what I want to try and show you now is that failing to merge files when they co-refer courts the danger of ignorance. Here's a little diagram. Suppose I've got various ways of recognizing somebody. I can recognize somebody by their face, by the sound of their voice, by by their gait from behind, by the opinions they express. I suppose I've got 10 different ways of recognizing somebody. And suppose that I acquire the information that the person recognized the first way has, has various features. They can, they can speak, they can speak French. Uh, they, They like, they like cheese. Uh, they, 
they vote Labour. Okay, so the, uh, uh, somebody who looks like this, I know these features of. And now I've got a different way of recognizing somebody who walks like this, and now I'll have some more features, probably some, some overlap in the features. I might end up with, okay, there's 10 different possible people, and I've got various bits of overlapping information about them. In the case you have in mind, it's all the same person, but uh, you might be very cautious and not merge the files. And now you'd be able to have all that information. Uh, you're, you're being cautious about whether it's the same person. And right now, to write down the information you have, you need, you need 90 thoughts, 90, 90 uh, uh, sentences in the language of thought. And now compare it with this picture. Now, in virtue of uh, my commitment to these all being the same person, I can, I can merge the files like this. And now, given any of the, the criteria by which I identify this person, I can promptly infer any of the collective features that were attached to those different files. So now I can store the information much more economically. Now, let's suppose that our mental resources are limited. We only have so much room in our heads to put information. If, if our mental resources are limited, doing things this way is, is liable to uh, exhaust our resources. We have much more, much more space for information if we do things this way. So that's the idea. Merging files is, is a cognitive economy. It, it allows us to store information more economically. Not merging files thus risks the danger of ignorance. Okay, this kind of setup pervades cognition. I'm illustrating the point with people, but the same applies to particular animals. You might recognize a dog in a number of different ways, and you might know a bunch of things about the dog so variously recognized, and it would be much more efficient to put all the information into one file. Animals are special cases of persisting objects. I might be able to recognize a certain car, my car, in a number of different ways, and I might know a pile of different things about my car. And you don't want to store this information in a bunch of different files, one for each way of recognizing the car. Unbelievably inefficient. I'm talking here about particular objects, particular objects that can be identified in many different ways, and once identified, can be taken to display a suite of features. Persisting objects like that are one case of what Millikan calls substances. But in fact, the whole idea of substances is much more general. There are any items in which properties cluster, any items that can be recognized in a range of different ways, and once recognized can be used to anticipate multiple further features. So natural kinds in general are chemical substances. I can recognize that something is gold or water in, I'm a chemist, 30 different ways. And having recognized it, I can infer a pile of other things. Uh, its melting point, its boiling point, its conductivity, its uh, disposition to combine with other substances, and so on. Now, biological taxa. I'm now talking about species rather than individual animals. There's a suite of different ways in which I can recognize that something's a tiger. Having so recognized it, there's a suite of different bits of information. I can infer from that. Uh, social categories are like this. I can tell that somebody is, say, a Roman Catholic in a zillion different ways, a zillion, a suite of different ways, and having so uh, identified uh, their religious commitment, I can infer a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, this, this kind of structure uh, 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 pervades, pervades our environment. And uh, it allows us to economically represent the world precisely by merging files. Uh, okay, here's a couple more examples. Uh, 
I've been talking about high-level thought, but the same kind of structure goes on in lower-level cognition. Just think about perception. Perception, the perceptual powers that we share with many other animals. Uh, uh, a number of people have pointed out that what's characteristic about perception is that I can recognize something as a tiger uh, via a pile of different perceptual signs. Uh, a little bit of its skin, the way it walks in the back, the noise it makes, uh, perception will uh, uh, take any of those signs and form uh, a perceptual representation of a tiger. It's exactly the same structure. We might even find this structure in very early vision in object files. Uh, early vision uses multiple clues to track objects, recognizing them as the same again, even after they've disappeared behind something. <coughs> Uh, and they do it precisely in order to anticipate that the same object will display the same features. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. I'll come back to it next week. This is about uh, this picture of the economy involved here. Uh, takes the metaphor of words and files very literally. And you might wonder, if we really try and cash out this metaphor in neural terms, will the thought that this is more economical than that really stand up? And there's some questions here, and I think what we come to is the thought that it's not so much economy of storage, but speed of cognition that's important in, uh, for biological organisms like us. We want to have this kind of structure rather than that one to ensure that we can reach conclusions quickly. I don't really think the storage issue is a big issue, but I think the speed of cognition is a very big issue for organisms, and that's why they need to merge files as far as they can. Okay. Uh, that was all designed to show you why we want not to multiply files but to merge them. It's to do with economically representing the kind of world that we live in. The question for next week will be, do we want to type our ways of thinking more finely? And Francois still wants to bring in uh, modes of presentation in addition to the names we have for things in the form of merged files. And I'm going to argue next week that we don't need any such modes of presentation. One issue will be the question of indexicality. Some of you will know that there's a strong tradition, an important tradition in uh, philosophy of mind that says it's essential for various purposes, and in particular for purposes of action, that we represent the world indexically, uh, not via name-like representations, but via uh, relational representations, like here and now. And I'm going to say, yes, there is a context in which such representations are essential, but it's a very specific context. It's not something needed in all uh, aspects of thought. Uh, and so, the main part of next week's lecture will be looking in more detail at whether we need more fine-grained uh, counting of concepts than just counting concepts by reference. And I'm going to look in, in particular at four different purposes to which such fine-grained counting of concepts has been put by philosophers and argue that none of them uh, really justify uh, bringing in anything further than reference. So I'll be looking at how is reference fixed, I'll be looking at how we explain the reasoning people go in for, I'll be looking at how we attribute beliefs to people in public discourse, and I'll be looking at the idea that one person can communicate a certain thought to another. 
And I'll say, in none of these contexts do we need anything other than name-like thoughts. Thinking of thoughts as names for objects is going to do all the work that needs to be done. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Ten minutes for questions. Thank you for that. Uh, very interesting talk. I'm largely convinced by this sort of view, but um, I was wondering whether uh, the way you presented the arguments in favor of merging mm. didn't sort of conflate two separate objections. So there's a, this James Yin danger, as you put it, mm. which is ignorance. But that seems like it's a different point from simply the point about being uh, uneconomical. Uh, what I have in mind is really the alternative to a merging picture is something like a linking picture where people argue there's something like a mental identity predicate or that there's some alternative way of representing identity via a relational concept. So you have some other concept, which is the concept of identity qua relation. That's a different way of representing numerical identity from representing it implicitly in terms of how many files you have, right? But then the person who links files, it's not as if they're ignorant of the identity. They're aware there is an identity representing it via this mental identity predicate. Mm -hmm. So you could still, against that view, uh, go through with an argument that this is too costly in various ways, and that, that may well be the case. But that doesn't seem quite the same thing as saying, if you don't merge files, then you might um, not represent facts about the world that you should represent. It's just that you represent the same facts using mm. a different kind of representational format. Does that uh, Yeah, so, uh, so the, that could have been clear about this. The ignorance that I was pointing to the avoidance of was not represented in those diagrams. As far as the diagrams go, the information is just the, the same. It's rather the ignorance of things that you would have got to know if you hadn't used up so much time and energy uh, doing it the long way round. So that's, that was the thought. And, and the bit I skipped, uh, uh, looked at the computer analogy, it looked at arguments from, I've had come back from people who work on data structures and computers, saying, look, it's not, it's not so obvious that at the bottom implementation level, the, the structures behind the merge files are more economical in terms of storage than the structures the other way around. And I then switched the argument to the point, it's not so much uh, uh, the, the, the economy of how many uh, 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 items of information you have, but more the economy in terms of drawing inferences easily and quickly. And so it was going to be a much more short-term thing, like here I am and I've got a second, right, and I am going to be in danger of being ignorant because I can't think fast enough. But I can think fast if I have this nice, uh, smoothly unified file. That was the, that was the thought. That, that helps a lot. I guess we would still have to discuss what the point must what well, could be in having that concept of identity, what its benefits would be when it's actually very useful to mm. not merge files. It seems like we would want to also consider this if we're doing cost-benefit analysis. But just what, just one, one quick point. Uh, I, of course, don't want to deny that there's going to be cases and cases. I mean, you might take from what I said, we shouldn't be cautious at all. Let's just merge files whenever we can. You know, sometimes we're going to get confused ideas and error, but you know, forget about that. That's a, uh, no, uh, th th we, we want a judicious balance. Uh, uh, the dangers of error and danger of ignorance are both dangers to be avoided. We want to try and balance them. So we shouldn't merge files uh, uh, wantonly. Uh, we should wait till we've got pretty secure evidence, yeah. But once we have it, then it would be wasteful not to merge the files. Thank you, David. Um, so the reason you give, at least in this talk, for not liking the um, relational typing of uh, concepts as mental particulars yeah. is basically that it yields weird persistence conditions. So um, mm -hmm. 
when we first see something and then we remember it because the file has changed types and it's not numerically the same, the particular mm -hmm. is not numerically the same. Mm -hmm. And that's what we find in, the, in Francois's book. But um, I was just wondering if the weird persistence conditions are not the result only of the um, relational typing, but of a, an extra assumption that is that the type of the particular is essential to its identity. So, uh -huh. Good. so the particular can't change its type, but if you remove this bit, then we can have persisting particulars that change types. I don't know if that's a we metaphysically weird, but yeah. And then, so then we would need another reason to not have the relational types. I mean, depending on what they're supposed to explain additionally, etc. So, but yeah. But maybe if you think that in the end they don't explain anything more, like communication, belief attribution, we don't need it either. But at least the reason you presented. I, yeah, I'm not sure about it. OK, my, my, my objection to the original Reconati picture wasn't so much that it was odd for the files to go in and out of existence, that it was, but that it seemed costly to be transferring information uh, uh, from one file to another. Uh, that, uh, OK, uh, this is like Michael's question. I mean, how realistically do we take this representation of the architecture, but that was the objection. The picture you seem to be favouring is, looks like Francois's current view, that we have a persisting object that uh, effectively is constituted by an uh, evolving body of information, and then uh, at a certain time, we will, as it were, exercise that entity in thought. And perhaps when you exercise the entity in thought, then the relation that you bear to the object uh, referred to is going to matter for certain things. I mean, that's, that's Francois's current view. Uh, I'm going to say, no, the relation you bear to the object is neither here nor there for explaining anything very much. But uh, we'll come to that. OK, cool. But in the first place, we have the transfer of information because yeah. we had one file and then we have another one. So right, right. So, so, so no, there's no, in this picture, the current picture of, of files as uh, constituted by accumulating bodies of information, there's no transferring going on. That's fine and that's good. We're, we're, all, we're all happy with that. Hello, David. Um, I'm uh, trying to wrap my head around your way of using mm. the vocabulary of philosophy of language. No. Uh, it's different from how I mm. think and talk about it. Mm. Uh, but it would help me if you could clarify what role you envisage for yeah. notions such as truth, uh -huh. perhaps truth in a model. Uh, but uh, So I missed that in the way you presented it. Uh -huh. um, and. A sort of related question is, do yeah. you envisage all words of ordinary language and natural yeah. language yeah. to ha be associated with concepts, or are there certain words that are associated with concepts and others that are perhaps like the logical vocabulary that they're not? Uh, Those two questions. So the role of okay. truth and okay. uh, whether all words let, 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 concepts. Let, let, me, let me do the second one first. Uh, no, I mean, lo lo logical terms, there's no reason to think of it. I mean, we might or might not say that uh, uh, we have concepts that we express by logical words, but what I've been saying today was not really supposed to apply to uh, logical terms. It was supposed to apply to names of substances, also names of properties that don't amount to substances. That would be fine. Logical terms would need a, a separate uh, discussion, which probably relates to your first question. Yes. Where, 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 does, where does truth come into this? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so I regard questions of reference as posterior to questions of truth. So uh, we want to have thoughts that are whole representations. They have truth conditions. 
Uh, that's the important thing. I will tell you a story uh, later on about uh, the Tito semantics, success semantics, ballpark, that truth conditions are to do with uh, uh, the circumstances in which uh, 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 organisms' uh, uh, actions will succeed. That's, that's how to make sense of truth. That's how to understand that representation is a relationship between something inside the head and something outside. That this thing inside the head is standing proxy for something outside in the way the organism reacts. And then I want to think of reference in terms of certain items make systematic contributions to truth conditions. So, uh, and I will try and fill all that in later, not, not in detail, but in, in, in outline. So the idea that one can talk about reference in abstraction from thinking about truth conditions and the explanatory role of truth conditions, I think that's just a bad mistake. Uh, 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 which I went, I mean, I kind of encouraged today, and later on we'll start thinking about, well, reference is to do with the origin of the concept, uh, very natural idea, but I think that's, that's a superficial idea, and, and any, any metasemantics of reference needs to be grounded in a story about truth conditions and why they matter. Thank you. Thank you.